And I want to start with this question. What if we had a war and nobody came? <laughs> what a concept. What if we had a war and nobody came? You know, we have nearly 3,500 years of recorded history. 3,500 years of recorded history and less than 300 of those years have seen no war. 3,500 years of recorded history, less than 300, no war. And that's just the recorded history. Just think about what that tells us about mankind. What it tells us about our hearts. It's a sad joke, but I'll share it. The, you, the question's been asked through the ages, when will mankind unite? And the solution most people come up with is if Martians from other planets <laughs> invaded our planet, yes. and then we would unite to fight someone else. <laughs> That's the only thing that would bring us together. You know, this week we celebrate Robert Burns' birthday, and he summarizes it quite well. And man, or man, I'm trying to get the Scottish oh. thing going here. And man, whose heaven erected face the smiles of love adorn, man's inhumanity to man <laughs> makes countless thousands more. Well Recently, I was able to visit Sterling for the first time and see the Wallace Monument towering over that city. It's beautiful, and I'm learning in many ways the culture here, the psyche here, and I can't say it's too much different than other places in the world, but it, definitely here I'm learning that Scots are born fighters. Right. It's just the history, it's, you know, it seems as though the more I read, and it is complicated, I'll tell you what's helped me out. Someone bought, I, I believe it was the Pearsons, bought this for our children. You didn't know that you bought this for me. <laughs> this is an excellent book because Scottish history is very complicated. And that helps me out, but it, it's just this history of clan and geographic <coughs> sections of the country warring against each other and then traditionally one conquer after the next. It's a want to be conquer. It's this merry-go-round of people coming in and trying to take over Scotland. Yeah. And, and so, and then the Scots would unite and face off against whoever was trying to come in and take their land. So, just being in Sterling and being a part of the Wallace Monument, even understanding part of the re reason they built that is they wanted to build up this legacy, this fighting spirit uh, of independence. And that's a big part. And Wallace's legacy has grown a great deal compared to what his own people thought of him at that day. And I wanted to show you just a beautiful picture. You go near, this is not even the top of the monument, but you can look out over Sterling. You can see where the battle was fought. And what I found while I was there, you may not have seen this when you were there, I found one of the few pictures they actually have from the Battle of Sterling Bridge. And I wanted to share that with you. <laughs> you even have Battle of Glasgow against Edinburgh. Overstreet versus Ugolini. Yeah, I thought you'd appreciate that. <laughs> but Scottish history is very complex. You can see it, it's right there happening. I never really thought that uh, it would be great to bring a knife to church, but I, I, here I am today, a 
part of the Scottish culture. You've adopted me, thank you. <laughs> but it is a complex history. Uh, I was speaking of the would-be conquerors that would come in and the walls that we still have shortly after the time of Jesus. Yeah. We have Hadrian's Wall and, and multiple times that the Romans have come in and tried to move north. Now, the exciting thing for the Scots is they were never able to, get, no one's ever been able to do it. Yeah. Yeah. So there's this national pride in that that I'm starting to understand. But even looking statistically over a period of a thousand years, from 596 to 1575, we had nearly 60 battles between Scotland and England. And that doesn't even include the Jacobite battles. <coughs> of the 18th century. So it's built into the psyche of the country here, this born fighter mentality. Now for me, uh, one of my passions, one of my hobbies, it's a strange one, but I do enjoy history. Uh, I'm a want-to-be Civil War buff, the American Civil War. Now the irony about Civil Wars it, yes, exactly. The, the title itself, uh, Civil War, is oxymoron. But I, I really love the study of the American Civil War, and two Octobers ago, I went on a father-son trip with Nate, and we went to a lot of the battlegrounds, uh, most of them in Maryland, Virginia, and Pennsylvania in the United States. And you just learn so much about your history, and compared to Scotland, this is recent history. It's 150 years ago. And speaking of the Civil War, there's no getting around it. Nearly one million people died. Americans killing Americans. And that's more people, more death, than World War I and World War II combined for the United States. Killing each other. Killing each other. Uh, even when I, Nate is looking out over here, that's the bloody cornfield from the Battle of Antietam. Antietam was the bloodiest, deadliest single day in American history. 9-11 did not surpass it. Not even close. In one day, in this battle, in this small town in Maryland, 23,000 Americans died. Killing each other. Only 150 years ago. Now the crazy thing is, depending on where you live in the States and how you were raised, there's still disagreement on the reason for this war. Some refuse to believe it was about slavery. That you know, there's other things, that you know, there's battles even about that today. The dysfunction keeps on giving. The fighting goes on. But this battle, what was sad about it at Antietam, 23,000 died, and it's inconclusive on who actually won that day. So it's known as a draw, but the North liked it because strategically they could call it a win. That's a whole other story. I love talking about these things. But this is the bloody cornfield. That's where the battle that day started. And you can see, looking over Nate's shoulder, it's a very small area, and if you can envision all the corn stalks in the air, okay, it wasn't wide open like that. And so you had men facing men from the same country, smokes everywhere, body parts everywhere, you can barely see in front of you, the smell of death, indescribable destruction, a fight in this small area, 200 meters long, 400 meters wide. Roughly about 20,000 men fighting in this small area. 13,000 died in the matter of three or four hours. That's war. And then it continued into that day. And this is known as Bloody Lane. And that's me walking down it. And you can look back and see in some of the pictures they had then after this battle. 
you had dead men two or three deep on top of each other throughout this lane. And about 6,000 tied, just a matter of a couple of hours, right there. And, but here you have it. Uh, the war ended, the North won. People in the South still don't necessarily agree with that. But we're 150 years later, and America's still at war with them. The laws change. The outside of the cup gets cleaned. But as we talked about last week, the hearts still remain the same. Yeah. That's the condition of mankind. Our hearts are desperately sick. They just morph, they mutate, and they repeat themselves in different shapes and forms. That's the heart of a man. And as you even come to today... The war in Syria, the civil war, it's tragic. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And I can't think of anything more complicated. I still don't understand it. Mm -hmm. You can look at all the colors up here. That shows you the different factions warring against each other. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And that's the danger of war that we can fall into. We're trying. Look at this and you tell me who the good guy is and the bad guy is. But we try to do that, and the movies do that for us. But that's the danger of any war. We're always looking for the clear-cut good guy or bad guy, and it's simply, this is an example, it simply does not exist. Mm -hmm. yeah. And that's a, a horrific reality of war throughout history, is this mentality that God is on our side. Yeah. We're, we're on a crusade for God. The holy, quote, holy crusades, mm -hmm. declaring holy war. Mm -hmm. So when it comes to war, I say all that to say, based on what we've been studying and learning here and what we're called to be in Edinburgh, the type of people we're supposed to be as Christians. Mm -hmm. So looking at all this and what continues to go on in our world today, What's the ethos of the kingdom of heaven? Is war, as many Christians have claimed over the centuries, is war a necessary evil? In the first century, think about it. In the first century when Jesus brought the kingdom of heaven down to earth, what did he say about this topic? What did Jesus say? The king, when he brought the kingdom, what did he say about war? Let's read here in Matthew 5, verse 1. Now when Jesus saw the crowds, he went up on a mountainside and sat down. His disciples came to him and he began to teach them, saying, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they will inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be filled. Blessed are the merciful, for they will be shown mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. And blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called sons of God. So today we're going to talk about peacemaking DNA. And if we read verse 9, this could have been a shocking statement to the Jews who were listening to this or heard about this. All right? Uh, I've read enough of this book to know that there was a pattern of the royal heir to the throne many times for Scotland... Something would go wrong, and the baby boy would go off to France for a while. Yeah. And then the time would come, hopefully, where that baby boy would grow up and come back home the conquering hero and sit on the throne and make the, all things right. Yeah. Now, with that in mind, that, that's not original. Yeah. The Jews 
expected Jesus to come back as a conquering military hero. And I don't blame them for this. Because God used men like this in the past to lead his people. They expected a modern day Joshua. Or a King David. Or King Saul. Someone that would unite them. Bring them together. And break the chains of the Roman rule. So for them to hear this. You gotta, they thought that the Messiah would come and crush their enemies and elevate Israel once again to the glory of the past. And you see this in John 6, 15. You know, we have four accounts of Jesus feeding the 5,000. And that one, it tells us after he performed this incredible miracle and fed the people, what did they do next? They wanted to take him and make him king by force. Out with King Herod, in with this man. We need him in there, and we're going to do this by force. And Jesus, uh, that's when he started preaching the word. Next thing you know, he only had a handful of people that wanted to follow him. But they missed it. We miss it. History misses this. The words of Jesus can just deflect right off of our deceived hearts, our, our hardened hearts. We talked about this back in November when we introduced what the kingdom is. And as the kingdom was foretold, these scriptures in Isaiah are very helpful to us. Isaiah 2, Isaiah 9, Isaiah 11. They tell us and they told the Jews what to expect when God's kingdom would come. In the later days, this is what would happen. I'll give you some highlights. We read this before, but please look at this on your own. It's fascinating. 700 years before the birth of Jesus, Isaiah in Isaiah 2, verses 2 through 4, he says, It shall come to pass in the latter days. Okay, so he's coming and he's telling us when the kingdom comes, we will say, Let's go up to the mountain of the Lord. He may teach us his ways, that may, we may walk in his paths. He's going to judge between the nations, verse 4. He's going to settle disputes between the peoples. Now listen to this. They shall beat their swords into plowshares. And their spears will be beaten into pruning hooks. Nations shall not lift up sword against nation. Neither shall they learn war anymore. I missed this for years. And then when I saw it the first time, I go, oh, Blessed are the peacemakers. I get it. Amen. The kingdom has arrived. Yeah. So the kingdom of heaven is a heaven or it's a kingdom where the weapons of war transform into farming equipment. Mm -hmm. Jones and Brown in their book about the kingdom say this. What was once used to destroy life will now be used to nourish life. That's the kingdom. Isaiah 11, same concept. The wolf will dwell with the lamb on the mountain of the Lord. Enemies become mates. Verse 9 of Isaiah 11, they shall not hurt or destroy in all of my holy mountain. And then we have our famous messianic prophecy that we use at Christmas a great deal. In Isaiah 9, and if you read there around verses 5 or 6, it actually says we're going to destroy the military uniform. So every boot and uniform of the soldiers will be burned as fuel for the fire. And so we're going to have this new king, and it gives him the name. He, the government will be on his shoulders, and he's going to be called the Prince of Peace. So it's this vision of the kingdom of heaven to come 700 years in advance from Isaiah, and it's telling us we're called to be makers of peace, not war. Amen. But, history keeps repeating itself. Mm -hmm. yeah. On large scale, and in our relationships, mm -hmm. among the churches, among denominations, history keeps repeating itself. Born fighters, drawn to conflict, the heart of man chooses to wage war and not make peace. 
And what's so horrible about it, we rationalize this violence in the name of God. Yeah. We invoke the name of God. Blasphemy. <coughs> Man's and humanity to man makes countless thousands mourn. But blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called children of God. So let's define this peacemaker so we can embrace it and become even more of it and shine like lights in this way in this city. Amen. Defining peace. It, peace is not the absence of problems. It, it's something that happens in the midst of trouble and sin and challenges. It's not the absence of disagreement. Peace is not uniformity and we're all thinking exactly the same way about every situation. That's not what this is. Amen. But the Jews would understand this as shalom. They still use this word when they greet one another. And it's not only wishing, hey, let's solve our conflicts. It's also wishing the other person fullness of life. Amen. It conveys harmony for us musicians in here. Us, I like that. I say that. <laughs> you know, for us musicians in here, it, it's all the instruments, it's the notes, it's the chords, it's all blending perfectly. Amen. Where the opposite would be discord. Yeah. We'll read about that in a moment. But it, it's not a competition against one another in music. It sounds the best when it all comes together yeah. and it harmonizes. It's the concept of two people walking down the road hand in hand. So that's peace. Now, maker, the second part of this word is action. Maker, creator, source of. So it's not a passive word. Maker is this dynamic word. It has energy to it. So it would be wrong to read this beatitude the wrong way. Okay, so Jesus does not say, blessed by God are the peaceful. Mm -hmm. Alright, so as we're sitting here today, we may not have a lot of conflict in our life, but that's not what this is, I mean, that's great. Amen. But, thank God. But this is an active role. Mm -hmm. it, it's not someone who's peaceful, and it does not say, approved by God are those who hunger for peace. It's not a matter of being it or wanting it. It's a matter of being a source of peace. Amen. So this is a person who actively pursues peace. It's the character of Jesus. This is who Jesus is. This is what Jesus prayed about the night before he died. John 17. He wanted peace. He knew his own believers were going to have a hard time getting along. Paul's letters in the New Testament filled with encouragements to resolve conflict. It's interesting, it's so much less about, well, you need to fix this with the Roman Empire and this and that and government and King Herod. No, it, it was among the Christians and how Christians viewed the world. I mean, you can read in 1 Corinthians, like, hey, hey. Don't worry about judging the world. They live by a different standard. We, we, we need to work it out among ourselves. Amen. So it's the character of a Christian. Now here's what a peacemaker is not. You know, so many times when we define things, it's important to not go to a place or, or stop ourselves from going to a place of what we think it may be, but it's not. Right? A peacemaker is not the person that says, you do your thing and I'll do mine, and there'll be peace. That's not true peace. That's a band. -aid. The peacemaker is not someone who does not care what anyone else does, as long as it doesn't directly affect them. The peacemaker is not the appeaser. Okay? Someone that just will compromise for peace at any price. 
you know, an, an example of appeasement, no matter how you feel about war and what we're talking about today or fighting, but Europe in the 1930s, there's a lot of appeasing going on. Now, good reason for that, coming off the First World War. But appeasement is not the answer. Avoiding, you know, just giving people their, their way. And a peacemaker is not a person who's afraid of making waves. All right, and you see a couple of scriptures up there about what peace is not. Ezekiel 13.10. Uh, we read a few weeks back on the morning scripture and the Beatitudes, Jeremiah 6.14. It warns us against fake peace. Peace is not putting putty over big cracks and saying there's peace. Or putting a small band-aid on a deep, deep cut that needs stitches and special attention. That's superficial peace. But here's what a peacemaker is. This is the character of a peacemaker. First of all, a peacemaker is honest. If there's a problem, he or she brings it up. Now, keep in mind, as I share these things, you've got to remember the other be this attitudes as you bring these things up. All right, we're both at the foot of the cross here. Amen. Mourning our sin. Yes. We're both called to be meek. Amen. Prous. We're under the control, strength under the control of the Creator. So all that's a given here, I hope. But a peacemaker is honest. If there's tension, she brings it up. A peacemaker is willing to risk pain. Peace comes at the price of pain. Peacemakers risk being misunderstood. Peacemakers risk failure. If I've been wrong, there's pain for me in apologizing. But peace will come. If you're trying to help someone else who's in the wrong, there's a pain in correcting that person and rebuking and not really knowing how they're going to respond. So there's pain in that. And the temptation is to let things slide. So what we're talking about here, it's basic, but if you've been around the church a long time to live this out in real time, very difficult. And from talking to many of you, very difficult for people that have known each other 20, 25 years. Am I right? And the paradox of all of this is, and, and I'm thankful to Goldie, he was putting together one of the songs today, and he said, well, we're, we're going to do, tell me whose side are you fighting on? Should we take out that verse? <laughs> it's about peace today. I said, no, 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 no. The paradox of this is the peacemaker is a fighter. But the peacemaker is waging peace. The peacemaker will make trouble to bring peace. Waging peace. The peace of Jesus was a sword that divided families. Ephesians 4 verse 3. Make every effort to keep the unity of the Spirit through the bond of peace. Unity comes from peacemakers. Romans 14, 19. Make every effort to do what leads to peace and mutual edification or mutual building up of one another, building up of the church. Romans 12, 18. If it is possible, as far as it depends on you, live at peace with everyone. Amen. You cannot control what another man thinks or does, but as long as it depends on you, be at peace with everyone. And again, remember our definition of peace and all of this. Peacemakers will fight. They will essential. And we'll touch on this at the end before we take communion together. 
To be a peacemaker, you first have to be at peace in your relationship with God. Initially through repentance and baptism, but then living by the Spirit in such a way where you're at peace with God. Because once you're at peace with God, then you're able to help others make peace with God. And then in turn, peace comes between man and man, woman and woman, man and woman, peace between one another. But it starts with us making sure we're at peace with God. If we're having trouble in our relationships in the church, there's a wire that's missing or not plugged in correctly in our relationship with God. Now, it's easy to look at everyone else, and we do sin against each other. As they say, the church is awesome, except for the people. <laughs> but... If you're having problems with your relationships and the church, as they say, and that big, you know, the church, you, there's something going on in your relationship with God. Yes. If I'm having problems with this church, there's something happening between me and God that we're not necessarily at peace. And that's where it starts. That's where it starts. 2 Corinthians 5.18 teaches us that we're ministers of peace. It's not just me. Uh, we're all ministers. Of peace, We're trying to bring peace between people and God. We're trying to bridge that gap. And do we want to bring peace in the world? How do we view that as Christians? That would be a whole other topic of what we can do and, and how do we get into that. But I will say that as Christians, we are called as peace, peacemakers to work for peace in every setting possible. Because, and, and, and we may not have the legal power to do these things, but hatred is against God's will. Violence is against God's will in the kingdom of heaven. Strife, distrust, we need to bring peace to those situations. To be empathetic, to be the bridge between people. We don't need to be a people choosing sides. Because remember, that's where we fall into that rabbit hole of, well, who's really evil here? Let's turn our Bibles to 1 Corinthians 6. These are some sledgehammer scriptures that I'm about to share. And many times I've read them for the other adjectives in them and descriptions in them. But I want to hit on this concept of being a peacemaker and what the consequences are if we're not. But as we turn there, think about it. How often do we pray for our enemies? Mm. We're mad at our enemies. Yeah. We're mad at this leader, that leader, that country, this country, this person who left the church, this person who's me. But do we pray for them? Yeah. Oh and when people visit us, do they hear us praying for enemies? Remind me of this. You pray for it. Let's do this. We need to shine in this way. Amen. Prayer. The power of prayer. Not just praying for ourselves. Not just praying for our own sick. Praying for our enemies. Amen. But I do want to ask you this. Are you a peacemaker? Or are you a troublemaker? Uh -huh. yep. And that picture is not just for the women. Yeah. I put on the queen's jewels of drama way too often. And we laugh about it. But it's evil. It's evil. It's not the way of the kingdom. So we look at 1 Corinthians 6. Are you a peacemaker or a troublemaker? Again, think about it. We can be born fighters looking for a reason to fight, looking for a reason to complain, looking for a reason to criticize. 1 Corinthians 6, verse 9. I'm glad I didn't say it. I'm just repeating it. Do you not know that the wicked will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived. Neither the sexually immoral, nor idolaters, or adulterers, nor male prostitutes, homosexual offenders, 
thieves, greedy, drunkards, yeah! Nor slanderers, nor swindlers will inherit the kingdom of God. And that's what some of you were. That's what Paul's writing. That's what some of you were. He's assuming, that, he's assuming they don't want to be that. But he's addressing issues here, and it's easy to, to look at the quote-unquote big sins there. But slanderers in there. Yeah. Revilers yeah. is the word. People who are verbally abusive. The Bible calls that wicked. Verbally abusive. I've been hurt, so I will throw mud on the wedding dress. I've been hurt, so now that gives me the authority to throw the mud. And this word reviler, these are people who criticize others in an angry, insulting, and abusive way. There's constructive criticism, and there's abuse. Just angry, bitter abuse. It's wicked. It's ungodly. It's satanic. And the thing that's challenging about it is if you're hearing these things, or if you get into a place where you're saying these things, and I think we all do, or we think them at times, the challenge here is usually 10 to 50% of it's true. That doesn't make it godly the way we present things. Yeah. And what's happening in our evil heart. Yeah. Right? The, the, the point here is not to be right, it's to be righteous. Yeah. Right? And we can get to a place where we dedicate our lives or portions of our lives or seasons to our lives to just being verbally abusive. And then Galatians 5.19, it, it's worth reading for us here to see the contrast of what kingdom living is and what satanic living is. Galatians 5.19, the acts of the simple nature are obvious. Well, some of these are. They weren't always obvious. You know, some of these aren't obvious to me. Uh, the acts of the simple nature are obvious. Sexual immorality, sure. Impurity, debauchery. Idolatry, witchcraft, of course. Hatred. Discord. Jealousy. Fits of rage. Selfish ambition. Dissensions. Factions. This is in the like. I warn you, as I did before, that those who live like this will not inherit the kingdom of God. So... Not so much focusing on the sensuality here, but more the heart that goes back to the Robert Burns problem. What man does to man. The inhumanity that we do to one another. That's what it's talking about here. It's unchristian. We could lose our inheritance if we're a troublemaker in the church. And there's... Caution, and we talked about this at Hagmane, 1 Corinthians 15, 33. The caution is, do not be misled. Bad company corrupts good character. So just being around someone when they're in this state, or in this season of their lives. I'm not saying not to love them or listen, but it's a fine line here. I know for me, when I'm around this too much, it affects me. It drains me. It, it's like the app on your phone that drains the battery. And you know, I'm always trying to figure out, why is my phone? The battery's gone. Two seconds. Oh, it's that app and that app. They're the culprit. They're draining. Well, that's, that's how it can be. And so I, I'm not telling anyone to stick your head in the sand about sin and the problems around you. There's enough sin to go around here for us to help one another. We need one another. I'm the chief of it, of the sin. But for the sake of your soul and not going to hell, be the change you want to see. Yeah. And when you hear from other people, be the change you want to see. 
Be careful the company you keep. I think if nothing else, for your own personal joy and your sanity and your happiness level, we can only take so much. We're weak. Yes. But the opposite of this here, I meant to keep reading here the good news in verse 22 of Galatians 5. But the fruit of the Spirit is love and joy, peace. And then it goes on. And then it says, against such things there's no law. So, you know, we have speed limits, we have laws around here when you drive. What the Bible's saying is, there's no limit on how much peace you can give. God's not going to say, no more love! Stop! Please, no more self-control. No more peace, that's been enough. Those 300 years of your recorded history, that's enough. <laughs> there's no limit on this. And Paul goes on to write, you've crucified all that sinful stuff that I just mentioned. All this pettiness and criticism and anger and abuse. So let's not be conceited. You know, that's what happens. We criticize so much, we become so conceited. We've got it figured out. Smartest person in the room. And then we provoke one another. You know, we pick fights. Born fighters. But the beautiful thing here is, as we said about all these Beatitudes, to live this out is supernatural. Peace, the godly peace that we're talking about here, it's a fruit of the Spirit. You receive this at baptism. It lives inside of you. So if you're saying, well, I'm not really a person of peace. If you've been baptized into Christ, it's inside of you. God is inside of you. You can be this person. It's a battle every single day. Mm -hmm. Matthew 18, this is very helpful. I just wanted to take some extra time on this. Each one of these are probably a lesson in its own. But we read the last part of Matthew 18 about having mercy on one another. But Jesus gives us a basic template of when we have conflict with one another, what to do. Is this obeyed? Matthew 18, verse 15. If your brother sins against you, go get advice from four people. No. It's a fine line here, right? <laughs> Sharing my own struggles. If your brother sins against you, go and show him his fault. Talk about it. Go talk to the person. Just between the two of you. And if he listens to you, you point your brother over. But if you won't listen, take one or two other along so that every matter may be established by the testimony of two or three witnesses. If he refuses to listen, then tell it to the church. If he refuses to listen even to the church, treat him as you would a pagan or a tax collector. The goal here is relationships. Yes. Kingdom relationships. That's what this is. I think we can use this scripture a lot of times. It's, it's not necessarily... Three strikes, you're out. Discipline for every sin in the church. That's not this. The context of this is our relationships. Does this make sense? Is this how you want to be treated? But I know how insecure I can feel when I hear from other people and something someone feels about me because I'm so weak, so insecure, and you feel that way too, I bet. Yeah. But Jesus gives us the blueprint. This is heaven on earth. Heaven breaks loose when we say, you know what? I'm going to go talk to the person before I stir it up with more. And I'm, you know, I'm so guilty of this. Please pray for me. Because, you know, and, and serving in this role, you hear so much. You hear so much. So again, here's a great question. Amy's dad taught me this one day, and I'm thankful for this. Someone comes to you talking about something very legitimate, a way they possibly could have been hurt, or someone else that's sinning. They come to you, and a lot of times I'm saying this is with good intentions a lot of times. I, I, I don't want to judge people's hearts. Sometimes it's a bad heart, you know, but other times it's just we're not obeying Jesus. We're doing it in a worldly way. Great question. They come to you. So how did they respond when you shared that with them? And you're assuming the best, mm -hmm. that they talk to the other person first. Mm -hmm. 
But then if they didn't, oh, I, I haven't talked to them about it. Oh, well, hey, I love you. I want to help. Go talk to them. Our conversation on this topic is over. I don't want any part of that virus. You guys work it out. I don't need to think less or more of this brother because of something someone else said that may not even be true or just half true. This is so important, is it not? Yeah. Yes. This is so important. It's so important. And it can be missing. Yeah. I think the question we have to ask ourselves too in this concept of peace is, and, and I want to encourage you today, but ask this question first, how much do you allow troublemakers to affect you? Boy, we, we want to help people. We love people. We want to be patient with the weak because we're all weak at different times. We're all sinners. But it's hard because people, they demand love sometimes and give none. They demand mercy and give none. People can refuse to be the change they want to see in the church. Mm -hmm. You know, the old express, expression is, and we all can be like this. It's easy to see it in someone else, but people can live in glass houses yeah. and throw stones at everybody. Yeah, yeah. Sure. And that's hard. Mm -hmm. That's hard. In case you haven't noticed, this is not club net. <laughs> Been in the church for a while. I'm just breaking the news for you. 20 years later, it's not club net. This is not a luxury beach resort. Yeah. This is Christianity. It's supposed to be hard. That's why we're doing it. That's why it's awesome. That's why we've chosen this path. It's the narrow road. This is Christianity. We follow Jesus, the incredible hero who sacrificed everything. He looked at the cross and he scorned its shame. He said, I'm going. I will be humiliated because this is hard and I love people. I have a bigger goal in mind. Amen. Heaven awaits. Amen. It's supposed to be hard. And God didn't intend for us to live guilted out lives. We have enough guilt already. We know we're sinners. We're not meant to have insecure lives because someone's so critical that, that, that we didn't love them perfectly and meet all of their needs. I encourage you today. I mean, I believe many of you, of course you can do better, but many of us are doing the best we can. You know you can do better. Thank God for His grace. Get up tomorrow and live in God's grace. His mercies are new every morning. Don't be consumed with the troublemaker. Jesus, he's the one to look to. He has mercy on people. He loves people where they're at. He certainly loved the Pharisees, interacted with the Pharisees, cared for them, told the people to obey them. But he deleted that app on his phone when he needed to. <laughs> yeah. Unity. I think this is where we need to grow to as well. Oh. <coughs> Unity, we may have something in us from the past that we need to continue to flush out, deprogram, get it out of there. Unity is not thinking the same way on everything. All right? Mm -hmm. Unity is thinking together. Wow. It's a big difference. Peacemakers build unity with God. I'm thankful for that with the brothers in here and just sisters in here. We're not going to think differently. I mean, just even I'm so thankful for your grace in this transition. Ben and I do not think the same way about everything. Yeah, amen. Good, right? There's going to be weeks where, oh, you know, I, I understand it. it's the nature, you know, there's going to be weeks where, man, Ben's way was really great. Why aren't we doing that? You know, and there's going to be ways, well, Mark's, you know, and that, we're all fickle. We, we get like that. But he and I are unified. Amen. Amen. Amy and Nicola are unified. Yep. Yes. Because this, this is not about us. Yes. We're a speck. We're just a speck of time. Yep. Jesus leads. Amen. We're just playing a role. Yeah. And I hope you're playing a role as well. Amen. When we look at the church, we say, we. 
Not yeah. you, not them. We. Yeah. We're in this together. It's unified. And you know what the blessing of this is? We are called sons and daughters of God. Amen. You have peacemaking DNA. God views you as His because you're doing His work in this world. You have the same vision and passion that God does for this world. James 3 says the wisdom of heaven is peace loving. You're thinking like God. We have the mind of Christ, Paul writes in Corinthians. And just picture this. God is saying, when you are a peacemaking man or woman, God is saying, that's my boy. That's my dog. Just like he did when Jesus was baptized. I love her. That's James. That's my boy. That's Anna. That's my girl. That's my dog. They represent me. We have divine paternity. We learned that in identity, in our identity series. We're adopted by God. We start becoming the character of God in the way we live. What an honor. War comes from being a son of the devil. But peace comes from being a son of God. We become like our brother Jesus. That's the aim here. And it's supernatural. This is not a matter of bootstrap ethics and great morals and just toughing it out and or, or you know relying on a, a secular parliament to fix this. It's our lives. It's who we are. It's who we represent. It's our dad. Peace is impossible if left only for the human to make it happen. This is a supernatural quality we're talking about here. It's above human nature. It's impossible for us to do it on our own. But we do have steps that we can take to peace. Amen. This is the gospel simplified. The steps to peace with God. The steps to peace with one another. This is the initial step someone must take to become a Christian and have peace with God. And then to keep on that side with God. To bring others, bridge the gap, have them come on over. This is the key to unlock peace in all of our relationships. Is if we're standing with God. That's when we begin to grow and nourish instead of kill one another. Isaiah 59.2 tells us the separation between God and man. Then God says in Isaiah 27.5, let them come to me and make peace. Jesus is the Prince of Peace. And you see in the middle there, He's the one that bridges the gap. It says in Isaiah 53, the punishment that brought us peace was laid upon Him. Mm -hmm. Ephesians 2.13, you have been brought near to God through the blood of Christ, for He Himself is our peace. Colossians 1.19, you are making peace with God through the blood of Jesus. Romans 5.1, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. That's the way to peace. Amen. And when you're with God and God's Spirit lives in you, you have peace by way of the Holy Spirit. What a gift. I encourage us today, wherever you're at, make peace with God. If it's for the first time in the waters of baptism, or you need to leave here today and get on your knees as we've talked about each week and start over with the Be This Attitudes, make peace with God. And become a peacemaker. Make peace with those in here that you need to make peace with. Make peace with your neighbors. Make peace with your schoolmates. Make peace with your fellow employees at your work. Be a man or woman of peace. Make peace in your family, among your parents, your siblings. Be a peacemaker. You know, when Jesus came to this earth, He's the one that redefined peace for us. He saw the magnitude of our sin, and He knew only one solution was necessary. Only one solution would bring us peace. Jesus knew that he had to go to the cross, suffer, humiliation, and pain so he could become our peace. 
What an encouragement, inspiring thing it is that Jesus leads the way for us. Amen. Jesus is the one that leads the way when he says, Blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called sons of God. Let's pray as we take communion together. Our Father in heaven, thank you that we can even...